Back on a Monday night, everybody. Rory Johnston with John Navin, our guest mm -hmm. from John Navin and Associates, came in after a busy Monday to spend an hour with us and talk with you. So take advantage. 737 plus is the phone number if you'd like to call in. And Taylor, one of our regular viewers and loyal viewers. Taylor, how are you, sir? Good, Rory. Hope you and uh, Mr. Navin are doing okay. And I appreciate the program. Oh, thank you. Thank What's you. on your mind tonight? I am wondering if a person has a mortgage, yep. passes away, assuming it's just an individual name on the mortgage, and assume it's a good mortgage, I mean, it's a good rate and reasonable uh, balance left. For those that inherit that mortgage, can they automatically assume it as is, or do they have to go through some process uh, with the existing mortgage company um, like a refinance? To refinance or, 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 or take over the uh, existing mortgage. So hopefully I explained that well enough. Yeah. No, perfect, perfect. Yeah, uh, Taylor, you'll have to, or, or whoever the party is, will have to reapply um, because the asset will transfer, assuming it's not a spouse. I'm assuming that it's it's not going from a spouse to a... Is it going to a spouse or children? No, 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 just, just a, it's a single... Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. No. Then he'll have to. Uh, he'll have to. Whoever the inheriting party is will have to reapply. But now what will happen also though you'll get the they call it the stepped up in basis or the stepped up in value on that home. So your starting point will be totally different um, for tax purposes right. and for um, valuation. It basically yeah. steps up to whatever the value is today. But yeah, they have to. They have to reapply. And yeah. So through. they're gonna Taylor have to go through. Go through some hoops, but uh, uh, that's just the, the way the. Does it's that set up. include FHA and VA loans as well? Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. they'll they'll have to underwrite the loan again, which means they'll yeah. have to, uh, you know, verify that people who are borrowing the money are just as uh, strong credit wise as the person that that passed the house. Yeah. That, that might be a good thing if you had a mortgage that was you know ten years ago. Rates now are still lower yeah. by far than they were ten years ago. Oh, I know. Yes. Yeah. Uh, all right. Hey, thank you, Taylor. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. It. Have a good night. Ooh, I'm glad you mentioned rates because we mm -hmm. want to get back to the market a little bit. And the Federal Reserve, I know, um, you know, watches carefully. And Wall Street watches the Federal Reserve. And they're looking at world markets and had their meeting last week. And Janet Yellen came out and said, no change yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and, boy, that has an impact on the markets. But, it, you know, from a consumer perspective, you know, Everyone's waiting for these rates to start rise up, rising up again. You're you're out there looking to buy a house or yeah. refinance. You yeah. know, a lot of people have an eye on this, mm -hmm. right? Well, and, and the bond market's the same way. They've been affected by these. We've had historically low rates for the past two or three years, and we're, everyone keeps saying, "Oh, it's it's supposed to tick next year. It's supposed to tick, you know, next six months." Or it just isn't happening yet. So um, that money is still flying into the stock market. So the stock market still looks strong, a lot of volatility. Uh, and you were you were talking when we first opened about, you know, the, the swings in the market. Um, they're becoming vast and we're almost getting desensitized, desensitized to them because we see them so often. But they have a tremendous impact on your portfolio. Yeah. So you've got to find the right tools, the right investments, the right places to position your assets to make sure that you're do you look at these swings and these different stages of the market as, as learning opportunities for someone like you and others to kind of, ooh, okay, something happened there that maybe wasn't anticipated and that had an impact on on these certain uh, portfolios and, you know, we're going to be able to tweak this or change that? or mm -hmm. uh, you Definitely can do that. Also, though, go back to the, to the few items that are, consistent indicators I think but um, you know we had talked about some of this news being entertainment just to, to, to get the fear and greed going but if you look at balance sheets of the corporations if you look at the interest rate environment if you look at how much money these corporations are sitting in cash mm -hmm. so the market um, and again I'm, I'm fearful of making a blanketed statement yeah. but for the most part it looks strong but it, it can only look strong again depending upon right. what your time horizon You're is. You're talking about uh, tried and true over the years indicators, yes. uh, bellwethers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where if you, if you really look at the, the history of the market and you look at these bellwethers of, you know, 
all the noise and everything, but like you said, still you're looking at like when you look at blue chip, the big companies, and mm -hmm. you look at their balance sheets, and you look at this and that and that, and then you put it all together in a formula, and it spits out, you know, and mm -hmm. it, this has worked for years, mm -hmm. right? In, in, in it's been pretty, yeah, pretty good. In, in balance your allocation is a big thing. So asset allocation is something that I think. Uh, some folks don't realize the importance of allocation. So not just having the big blue chips, you want those, of course, but then you want some small companies, you want some value companies, you want growth companies, you want mid-cap companies, and you want some international. And you've got to get the allocation correct for what, again, your time horizon is or your risk tolerance. Um, it all boils down to that. What's your risk and how much time do you have? And if you have a guarantee on your income, well, then you can feel more comfortable doing that. If you don't, you shouldn't even be there. Right. So... 737 plus if you'd like to call in and uh, also uh, at the end of this as we do e each time uh, John is here we're going to put up some contact information where you can reach him a couple of offices here in the Nashville area uh, one of them down there my neck of the woods in Cool Springs mm -hmm. and uh, there's something you can go in uh, and do uh, called a portfolio stress test yes which we've talked about before mm -hmm. but for the new viewer out there explain what that is okay perfect um, the portfolio stress test is uh, an opportunity for someone to come in, mm -hmm. sit down with us uh, in a comfortable environment and really look at your portfolio in detail. So basically take a look at the investments that you're in. Mm -hmm. How is that going to perform if the market corrects again? So if we go back to 2008, what are you going to experience in your market, or in your portfolio? So if it goes down 38%, are you going to feel that 38% or are you going to be fine? But you'll be armed with the information on risk how much the market will go down, how much are you paying in fees? There's another big one that I see a, a lot of people come and they sit down and go, oh my, oh my gosh, I had no idea I was paying 3% to be in this portfolio. And it's, it's not uncommon. Well, if you're paying 3% in fees, that's eating away at your performance. Mm -hmm. So we look at, um, again, the, the risk that you're taking, we stress test it, we look at the fees that you're, you're paying, we see how your portfolio compares to the rest of the market, so if you're going to take on this level of risk, how does it look compared to other people who take mm -hmm. on that level of risk or other investment choices? It basically levels the playing field. So it's, it's something that, that uh, our clients have had a lot of success with. Uh, it helps put their mind at ease. Um, and I would, I would suggest it to anybody to have them come in, regardless of the size of their account, come in, sit down, see how you're performing. And uh, When you talk about the fees in some of these uh, portfolios, how can they vary so much and how do the those uh, funds that charge so much how do they even keep going why do people you know when there are others that are going to cost you less I've never quite understood that and where do these fees obviously the fund is managed mm -hmm. and there's a manager and hopefully I've learned that you want to look to maybe stability in that position and performance mm -hmm. and stability and on and on and you're gonna pay a little bit but they just seem to vary so much. They, they, they do vary a lot. Um, some of it is because they can get away with it. <laughs> some yeah. of it is because we just don't know. We don't know where to see them. The other thing is they're not disclosed. You know, we only see a one fee typically on your... There are not consumer protection laws that no. would disclose these fees, or, or they're there, but they're just they're purposely hard to find. Again, and we've been through the prospectus conversation where oh, you get the, uh, yeah, the thin prospectus yeah. and <laughs> no one reads that. So they're, yeah. they're in there, but what most consumers are not aware of is that every time they trade the portfolio, that fee gets passed on to the portfolio or the, the shareholders, the owners right. of that mutual fund. They don't have to disclose that. So there's trading costs that go on, and they, they say the average is about 1.5% that you don't even see. So the big thing is to look and go, okay, if I had $200,000 and it went to you know, $210,000, well, you got 5%, but people will come in and they'll say, well, my average return has been 9%. And, I, and it's, right. okay, you were here and you went to here. What What is that number? So when you back those numbers out, those are what your real fees are. So are And we've got some software and technology that, you know, you're not taking my word for it. You, I can sit down and show you from the experts that say, here's exactly what you're paying. Here's right. what your expenses are. Here's what happened to your portfolio. So, yeah, just I, I strongly recommend it, and we bounce it against the, the client's goals. Mm -hmm. Um, when you look at, at this asset allocation with your clients and, and making sure it's as balanced as possible, and ev you know every client's different, mm -hmm. right? As you say, they, they come to, the, to your office with different, uh, different goals, different stages in their life, different financial levels, mm -hmm. all of the above. 
Uh, but when you're looking at that asset allocation, when you say you like a balanced portfolio, what exactly does that mean? Does that mean uh, balanced? I mean, is it all sorts of funds to divvied up exactly, or or does your software help to kind of figure all that out? There's sure. international funds. There's this, and this this gets back to that sp that intimidation factor, yeah. where even I, when I look at my 401k list. You know, I see moderate growth and conservative and more aggressive growth, and I'm thinking maybe a little here, here. I'm kind of eeny, meeny, miny, mowing. Yeah. You know, you are getting, <laughs> you're you're doing well. You are. Out. There's like six points in each question. I love it. Um, depends on the style. So, S, let me go back and be. Uh, the literal answer: asset yeah. allocation is diversifying the portfolio amongst right. different assets. So. You know, you want some small cap, you want medium cap, large cap, you want international, um, but then you also want value and you want growth. So you want right. to blend all that together. How you do that um, varies from the style of investment that you're looking to make. So there's, without getting too technical, there's strategic and there's tactical. Right. Um, and what we're seeing more so in the future, especially in your 401ks, a, a move to a more tactical kind of investing, which means they're um, using some more ETFs or some of the index funds. Most mutual funds don't outperform their respective index, like 81% of them don't. So there's an argument that says, is there a style, and we have a style that we use that will overweight a little bit of the index to help see if we can outperform the index? Um, because the index is probably the best benchmark. But you can enter into an index inside your 401k right. for about a quarter of a percent or they call it a basis point, 20, 20 basis points you can get in. Right. Um, and this <coughs> is where it gets it gets really confusing and intimidating to typical, mm -hmm. which you understand why, yeah. right? Oh, well, I, in, I was, I was debating whether I toot my own horn. I'm not trying to toot my own horn. I'm saying I have the ability to take the complicated stuff that people can spit out that yeah. are very, very smart, decipher it, and share it with people in a way that they can look and go, oh, I get that. Yeah, it doesn't have to be as complicated as they make it. So, I want to talk a little bit about, we're going to talk about your um, retirement habits when we come back. Okay. Uh, six habits that John has for all of us. And also, I want to ask him about stock tips. <laughs> uh, the word on the street is, you need to buy this particular stock and ask him about how you deal with that. We're going to take a break. Wide open lines at 737-plus, everybody. Open line, I'll be right back. <laughs> 